CPAC Now America Uncanceled. Biden's campaign was bankrolled by wealthy donors that work on Wall Street and in Silicon Valley. Biden raised nearly three times more money than Trump did from neighborhoods with a median household income of more than $100,000. The Democrats are suddenly the party of the rich, and Biden has decided to reward them for their support with his student loan bailout forgiveness program, which is as regressive a government policy as there could possibly be. Meanwhile, besides helping his donors, the forgiveness won't solve the problem of colleges hiking tuition while degrees get increasingly worthless and very interesting. Almost half of college graduates work in jobs that don't require degrees. People are getting in debt for no good reason. We've heard about this over and over again. A majority of Americans actually don't go to college and those who aren't working, or excuse me, those who aren't going to college are subsidizing those who go to college and now they have to bail out their loans. Seems like a, uh, a crazy way uh, to run an education system. A very good friend of CPAC, Eugene Kontorovich, has been reading about, has been thinking about this and been writing about this. Um, he's a professor of law at George Mason University School, a Scalia School of Law, and uh, he joins us from our most favored of wonderful American allies, the state of Israel. Eugene, thanks for being with us on America Uncanceled. Great to be with you, Matt. So uh, I said, I, I really built this up. I said, you've been thinking and writing about this, and you have been, and I've been watching and reading what you have to say. Summarize why this policy is so such a problem. Uh, well, it's f foolish, unwise, and unconstitutional. Uh, as a matter of fact, this policy is bad and misguided from pretty much every perspective. And the story of our higher education crisis is a story of governmental folly in pretty much every way the government can do something wrong from interfering with markets, messing up the markets, um, and uh, ultimately taking unconstitutional action. So first you have you start with these government student lo government loans, which are supposed to make education attainable and uh, and affordable. When the government uh, it intervenes in the markets to provide these uh, subsidized loans, they don't act like a private sector lender would, uh, would act. This is the initial original sin of educational loans. When you go to the bank for a loan uh, and you say, you know, I have a business idea, can you give me a business loan? They're going to listen to your business idea and if it's a good idea, they'll give you loans on a good terms and if it's a crazy idea, uh, they're going to give you, uh, they're going to not give you a loan at all. Uh, in college loans, Think about this market. The basic feature of this market is the interest rate on the loan, the price of a loan, is the same if you're going to MIT to study biomedical engineering as if you're going to Wesleyan to study protest theater. Right? You're paying the same for that loan because of the government subsidy. So guess what? People go to colleges they shouldn't be going to, and they study things nobody should really be studying to if their goal is to recoup their investment because it's not an investment. And the dirty secret of American education is that it's not pri primarily an investment in your future earnings. It's a consumption activity. Right? College is four years of coddled partying with a few <laughs> seminars that you attend. Kind of like one of those tours where you like travel and have luxury travel and some professor gives you a lecture on the boat. That's what college is. And now, with a good measure of progressive indoctrination thrown in, which is why the system is uh, is is being bailed, Eugene, being bailed you, out. Uh, but from a Eugene, you put you tweeted recently, Biden's student loan forgiveness dictate seems to violate separation of powers. Much less clear is who would have standing to challenge it in court. Your point in this tweet is a little different from the point you're making, which is, is college a waste of time? How expensive is college? Who should subsidize college? But then you have this very question about uh, you who works for uh, at the Scalia School of Law, one of the most eminent uh, law schools in the country. Why do you have big legal questions of Biden's ability to even do this forgiveness? Right. So the, the, this, this forgiveness is a huge uh, 
spending program, essentially. The government's buying out these loans. Uh, it's a, perhaps one of the, the biggest single budget items you could imagine, uh, and it's being done with the stroke of a president's pen. In our constitutional system, budgetary decisions, huge policy decisions like this, are made by Congress. It's the president unilaterally appropriating a trillion dollars, and that go, uh, that completely defies the separation of powers, but, and there's no statutory authority for it whatsoever. And the Biden administration knows this. Nancy Pelosi has previously said this. Biden has previously said we don't have the statutory authority. But when they needed to take do something before the election, they acted knowing they don't have statutory authority and making up something about a 2003 law that was designed to uh, help veterans Eugene, meet their is, payments. Uh, being is, a is anyone challenging this? Well. Is there like, are the Republicans taking this to court? Any other nonprofits? <laughs> uh, so I have not seen any challenges so far. It's crucial that it be challenged promptly in court because the thing about this is once the money is spent, you can't get it back. Even if a court subsequently rules it's unconstitutional, once the loans are forgiven, they can't be reinstated. So that's why he's trying to d get this done quick. It's kind of like vaccine mandates. <clears throat> All those people who were vaccinated before courts ruled that it was unconstitutional, you can't unvaccinate them. So it's important that people challenge it, but finding a plaintiff who has been injured is not obvious. But I think there are, uh, I think there are real plaintiffs that could have standing. For example, universe, states. States run their own university systems. Why do states like Florida, for example, or Texas run, uh, run university systems? To provide their citizens with a more affordable education than what's out there. But if it turns out that the education that's out there is going to be given free. The federal government is going to change the rules in the middle of the game and make public edu private education, pardon, free. It totally uh, undermines the case for states having public universities. Now, s public universities were the basis for standing in the um, state lawsuits against the Trump executive order about immigration. Uh, Hawaii sued, saying that because uh, there was a suspension of uh, visas from Sudan and Syria, they're going to have some kind of fall off in foreign students, even though that's a highly conjectural proposition. By that reasoning, which courts upheld, certainly a state like Florida could say they suffer injury uh, um, as a result of the fundamental better. rewriting of, uh, of the is, rules is of it, education economics. Would it be a better cause if a state challenges this, or is it going to be better uh, if individuals who are now going to subsidize college goers challenge this? So there's the the... the fundamental problem with standing here is that taxpayers simply don't uh, don't have standing by virtue of having their money misspent. That's one area in which the courts have clearly said, simply because the government's doing something illegal with your money or spending it unconstitutionally, you don't have standing because that injury is widely shared. But states might indeed have standing, especially because of the broad expansion. And it would be a beautiful irony if using the precedents uh, established uh, to tie up the, uh, to paralyze the Trump administration, uh, served as a basis yeah. for challenges. Who else might have standing? Private colleges. So most private colleges take federal student loans. Um, so uh, they, can, they cannot be said to be aggrieved. But there's about 20 some small private colleges, uh, mostly Christian, almost I think exclusively small Christian colleges, Hillsdale, Grove City Colleges, places like that, that do not take any federal funding, including federally backed loans for their students. Now, they can argue that they have been harmed because they opted in to a set of, a system, right? Not taking federal funding because there was one set of rules, uh, namely that like you have the loans that you have to pay off, right? If it turns out that federal loans are free gifts, that fundamentally undermines their economic uh, their economic basis and could pose an injury to them. So they would be potential plaintiffs also. Uh, the uh, the other argument that you bring up and others are bringing up is this idea of just subsidizing colleges. So like we forgive all these loans and then the next, all we're doing is encouraging the, all these universities who we're mostly pretty mad at anyway, and mad that we subsidize almost every single one of them, whether it's research or subsidizing loans or subsidizing grants or basically subsidizing tuition. You have this question about the affordability of college and Elizabeth Warren, Senator Elizabeth Warren, the American socialist was recently on CNN talking to Dana Bash. Let's watch this clip. What do you say to Brian and others who say that this is really not fair 
that student loan is just one kind of debt and there are other people who don't have that but have other struggles that the government isn't helping them with? You know, I think a lot about fairness. And I think about how education debt is different from other debt. I look at it this way. I wanted to be a public school teacher from the time I was in second grade. My daddy ended up as a janitor, and there was no money for me to go to college. But I found a public university that cost $50 a semester. And for a price I could pay for on a part-time waitressing job, I finished a four-year diploma. I became a special education teacher, and it opened a million doors for me. That opportunity is not out there today for any of our kids. You know, Eugene, um, I think we can all agree that colleges have been outstripping inflation for decades and, de and decades. I think about what I paid to go to college. I'm sure everyone thinks about it. And then we think about what we're paying for our kids. We're doing nothing to slow that price point to make it more affordable. Elizabeth Warren talks about going to college at $50 a semester, a uh, heck of a bargain. Nothing that Biden does is going to make college cheaper. Is that right? That's right. Once, coll once colleges know that students have an expectation that their loans may be forgiven or deferred eternally, they uh, are only going to jack up their um, right. uh, jack, jack up their fees. And how are they going to do that? Why has college gotten so expensive? I think that's important to understand. And this was the earlier point that it's become a consumption activity. The price of paying a professor to stand in front of a class and lecture has not gone up significantly. You know, the price to teach someone Plato uh, or Lincoln's writings has not really uh, increased. Colleges have really become kind of like amusement parks for 18 to 21 year olds, and the money has been spent on student centers, entertainment, and a thousand associate deans to hold the students' hands and introduce them into the ways of diversity, equity, uh, and inclusion. And that is where the real ramp up, it only takes one person to teach a class on Plato. You don't need two. So where are all the extra people coming? They're coming in the administration office, DEI officials, and student life officials. I remember when the President Trump got elected, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal about the University of Michigan uh, having a white room created and giving students crayons so they could write their feelings on the wall. Right. So that takes staff, that takes money. And it's become basically like a... Uh, amusement park uh, for kids, and that price can keep going up and up indefinitely, if, especially if people think they're not going to actually have to pay the bill. The, uh, it's long been said, and I don't know if this is right, I want to ask you to, to verify that approximately two-thirds of Americans don't go to college, a third of Americans go to college or attempt to take some college. Is that roughly right? Uh, more than just a slender yeah, majority right, of Americans yeah. don't so, go to college? So so the majority of Americans uh, uh, do, uh, do not go to college. And not that there's anything wrong with going to college, but people also need to take responsibility and they have to understand that if they want to be, uh, you know, studying postmodern uh, critical theory for four years, right, they're going to have a hard time paying that bill. Uh, you know, I'm sure lots of people want to go study surfing on the beach for four years, but they're not expecting other people to, to subsidize this. And, uh, and really college is kind of like a... Uh, kind of intellectual surfing lesson. Um, so, <laughs> you know, the only thing I'm going to disagree with you on, Eugene, and Eugene, just so ever, all of our viewers know, Eugene and I have spent a lot of time together. He's a one smart dude and a really good guy and has helped us uh, as we've done these CPACs internationally. But, Eugene, you might be missing it. I can get the fact that the finance major might have a better prospect for a big, high paying job and maybe the banks would like to loan him money. But I think you're wrong about these people spending four years in a postmodern, uh, you know, um, critical philosophy structure of how America is racist and Western civilization is hateful. I actually think the job prospects for them might be very good. Isn't that what everyone's looking for? Diversity officers, all the layers of bureaucracy that go beneath and around these diversity offers and everything else. I mean, maybe this is kind of like a, a boon market for these kids. Well. It's exactly the thing we've been talking about. That's why the cost of college keeps growing up because they need to expand their DEI departments right. and their compliance departments to hire to hire their otherwise uh, unemployable graduates. So this loan forgiveness is really gonna uh, is gonna provide jobs for them by encouraging colleges to hire uh, to hire even more. The uh, the thing I notice, uh, uh, I'm sure Eugene, you you do hiring as well, is that 
there's uh, what you notice a lot in, in younger employees is that they have been taught to write um, and they haven't necessarily spent a lot of time on logical and not critical race theory, but critical thinking. Um, and, uh, and so this idea you bring up studying Plato could be the very solution that a lot of these uh, young folks need to study, yet that also seems to be devalued in our economy. Is part of the problem with the fact that colleges are doing such uh, a weak sauce job of preparing young people to really take on the problems in society, is that equal to the problem that a lot of big companies um, have lost their way and aren't hiring people with the skills that they need to really grow these companies and solve problems in society? Yeah, I don't know the colleges are turning out people uh, in sufficient numbers uh, with, uh, with with the right skills. And again, partly it's the fault of the colleges and it's the fault of the government by subsidizing these loans. Remember, the student, by definition, is uneducated. Right? He's going to college for an education. He looks around and he sees that French literature, a major, has the same interest rate on the loan as economics or engineering. That, that student could think, oh, maybe the prospect, maybe the prospects are the same, right? In a sense, we are misleading these students by subsidizing uh, these um, unrewarding opportunities. And by the way, I like French literature, I like literature, I like philosophy, but um, it's wrong to expect uh, the American, the hardworking American taxpayer, to subsidize those things that you can frankly uh, do on your own, do on your own time, um, listen to some tapes or something. Uh, so the but what and. What's particularly shocking is the government is taking this unconstitutional action specifically to, you know, you, you put it in socioeconomic terms, which is true, it's, it's, it's an upper class, it's an elite class, but it's specifically universities where the progressive indoctrination um, that, the, uh, that the Biden administration presumably favors is the strongest that is getting this, um, this freebie. So it, it is a huge trillion dollar gift to a politically favored class, right? Um, you know, I think, I think if the private colleges were all Grove City College, uh, um, then they wouldn't, be getting, uh, they wouldn't be getting this money, right? If they were small, pri small Christian colleges. Uh, so the, uh, it's a subsidy to what is happening in college. And I think that's not accidental. Uh, final question, Eugene. It seems to me when Republicans take over these majorities, certainly a House majority sees, seems almost assured. A Senate majority is tougher, but I still believe it's very possible. Um, in the face of what Biden's done to forgive all these loans, shouldn't Republicans look at each and every nickel that flows from the federal government to any universities across this country, especially those teaching young students to hate America? Why does the American taxpayer have to fund these colleges and universities, wouldn't it be better for everybody if we just got the government funding out of the process? Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the biggest forms of funding is these loans, right? The, uh, the implicit funding, you know, lots of funding is grants for various scientific research projects, that's fine. But the broadest kind of grant is subsidizing loans that let people go and study things uh, that maybe there's uh, no market need for in the first place. So as I think as, as, as I was suggesting from the beginning, the entire student loan market needs to be rethought because we typically think words are misleading. So we call it education and it's run by the education department. But if we think about this as necessarily education as is something that will give you skills uh, to succeed in life and provide for your family, you know, just because it, you know, it calls itself an education doesn't mean uh, it, uh, it's actually uh, an education. Uh, and certainly the government's role in this seems uh, entirely unjustified. What is for many people a four-year vacation being supported on the backs of other people working hard when they're 18, working hard when they're 19. Fair enough. Eugene Kontorovich, thank you for joining us. Thanks for all your great partnering on our CPAC projects overseas and here in America. And thanks for joining us today on America Uncanceled. Great pleasure. Great to see you again. Take thanks, care. everyone, for tuning in, and we'll see you tomorrow.